Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world and where you're joining us from. It is 10 o'clock uh, in Santa Barbara, California, where the fielding offices are located. So we're going to get started with today's presentation. And this presentation today is for anyone who's ever wondered, what are those admissions committees thinking? What do they do with all of those documents they asked me for? Do they even read my statement of purpose? I, un I earned my undergraduate degree 20 years ago. Does my experience even matter or, or are they only looking at my GPA? So today's presentation is meant to go beyond just the fielding application requirements and to really give you insight into graduate admission committee considerations that will be useful for you no matter where you decide to apply. As Jane mentioned, this session is being recorded. So we encourage you to keep your microphone on mute, uh, keep your video turned off and to mitigate any distractions and to ensure a pleasant experience for everyone. We will have a Q&A section at the end, so plenty of time to answer your questions, but we don't want you to forget those questions. So as they may come up during the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat. If it's appropriate for that slide, we may try to get to the question. Otherwise, we will definitely make sure that we get all of your questions answered at the end. This is our part two of our virtual open house series. For those of you who attended part one last week, thank you. Uh, that was all about fielding. And today we're talking about application tips. So why are we doing this? We really wanna provide you with the insight that we as admissions professionals kind of take for granted. If you've attended an application tips webinar in the past, you'll probably notice a different framework for our webinar presentation today. We're not just going to walk through the steps of the application, although we will be doing that uh, in the end but our goal is to really empower you to approach your graduate application with confidence. So our presentation is going to give you insight into what may seem like a pretty secretive process, but it really boils down to three main concepts that we're going to discuss in the following slides. My name is Erica Fichter. I serve as Director of Recruitment and I have been in my role at Fielding for about a year and a half now but I have nearly a decade of experience in graduate admissions, and I've served on numerous admissions panels, both domestically and internationally. And today, I'm excited for the opportunity to share the insight that I have gained over the last 10 years of my career. And with me today, I have my two illustrious panelists. Uh, Caroline Wedderburn, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Erica. My name is Caroline Wetterburn. I'm the Senior Admissions Advisor for the programs within our School of Leadership Studies, as well as the PhD in Infant and Early Childhood Development. I've been with Fielding for a little over two years, and I really just love hearing about what you're all already doing, as well as your motivations and goals to bring about positive changes in your respective fields, communities, and organizations. So thank you for allowing us to be part of your higher education journeys while you explore Fielding. Brian? Thank you, Erica. So yes, I'm Brian Wallen, and um, I'm glad to meet everyone and see all the familiar names here. I'm the admissions advisor for our School of Psychology's clinical psychology programs, and I'm truly happy to be here um, in such a re rewarding position where I get to assist so many passionate people on the road towards their goals in graduate education. So thank you. Excellent. So some of the topics we're going to be covering today are, again, those committee considerations, um, admissions documents and best practices for each phase of the uh, admissions cycle. Um, we're going to review the application portal for those of you who are interested in applying at Fielding. Um, and then we're gonna talk about your next steps. And then as I mentioned, we'll have plenty of time at the end to address your questions. The first thing you need to know uh, when it comes to demystifying the admissions process is that believe it or not, the committee really has your best interest at heart. Um, so although there may be schools out there that pride themselves on competitive admission rates, uh, for the most part, the committee is really looking for reasons to admit you, not, re not reasons to keep from offering you admission. Um, and I want to note that today's presentation is most relevant for a holistic approach to admissions, meaning that all of your materials are weighed equally together before making a final admission decision. Um, and it has been my experience at the graduate level that this is typically the case, but you definitely want to ask the admissions team at all the schools you're considering how they go about making admissions decisions. 
So it may seem nebulous, but it really boils down to three things that the committee is thinking. Is this the right program? Is this the right place? And is this the right time? Again, this is with your success in mind. As they review your admissions package, that's what they're asking themselves. Is this program right for what they want to accomplish? Are we the right place? Is it a mutual fit? And is this the right time? So on the next few slides, we're going to go more in depth about what each of these means. Before we jump into that, I did want to provide a brief overview of the programs we offer at Fielding. Uh, we're going to be making mention of particular programs that have the requirements when we get to that phase. So just briefly wanted to review that with you. So within the School of Psychology, we offer doctoral degrees in clinical psychology and media psychology and infant and early childhood develop, de development, a master's degree in media psychology and certificates in media psychology, uh, post bac certificate in clinical psychology, a postdoctoral certificate re-specialization in clinical psychology, and a neuropsychology specialization training program. And within our School of Leadership Studies, we offer doctoral degrees in EDD, Leadership for Change, PhDs in Human Development, Organizational Development and Change, and a PhD degree completion program, and certificates, too, certificates in evidence-based coaching and organizational development and leadership. So first thing is, is this the right program? What do you want to do? Can this program actually help you to accomplish that? The last thing we wanna do is admit you into a program that is not gonna meet your expectations or bring you closer to realizing your goals. So how do we determine this and what materials are sending this message to the committee? The first thing is your statement of purpose or maybe called a personal statement or other type of essay depending on how the university approaches it. In future slides, we're going to talk about best practices for each of these materials. But for now, we just wanna highlight the items that give you insight into how the committee uses these materials. Another place the committee might look for this is in your letters of recommendation. Uh, that's why it's important to prepare your references, again, as we'll discuss later on. And depending on the university, your resume may also be considered in determining if this is the right program, as it can really tell the story of how your experience has shaped your goals. Finally, always remember that faculty and staff engagement may also be considered. How have you expressed your goals within your interactions? So before we go to the next slide, I do want to point out, it's perfectly fine if you don't know exactly what you want to do. We don't expect you to say, I want to go work for company X in position Y, for instance. Graduate school is a very transformational experience. So even if you are one of the lucky ones that has that figured out and knows exactly what you want to do, we still encourage you to remain open to new experiences and opportunities based on the people you meet and the knowledge you gain in your program. The next step is, is this the right place? So when you're thinking about this, what matters to you? What are you looking for a school culture? What are you looking for in a community? This is really all about fit. So that can also mean something as simple as modality. You know, if you state to us that you prefer a traditional experience, then a distributed environment such as the one fielding offers may not be the right place for you. So you'll see similar documents here as in the last slide that provide the committee with insight about whether or not the school you're looking for is, is the, really the right place for you. And the third team thing is, is this the right time? Are you ready to be successful in the program? Is there sufficient evidence that you have the skill set, whether that be academically or experientially, to be successful in the program? Do you have the time available to dedicate to the program? And that's going to range depending on the type of program that you're looking for and many other factors. It's, again, a very personal experience and each application is, is very different. Uh, so that means something different to each person. Um, but that's, again, the third thing that the committee is really thinking about whenever they're determining um, whether, whether this is the right thing to do to offer you admission to the program. So now that you have a little bit of a framework about how to approach each of the aspects of the application, we're going to go deeper into each section and discuss some best, best practices. First is the statement of purpose. Why do we ask for this? In some places, again, it may be called a personal essay. There, there's different ways that it can be, that it, that it might be presented to you in the application. But the purpose is to get to know you and understand, you know, your personal and professional goals. That's how we 
figure out, again, is it the right program? When that's how we learn. What do you want to accomplish? And are we going to be the right place to help you actually accomplish that? It's also how we understand why you're interested in this particular university. You know, how do you know that we're the right fit for you? I like to say that this is where you kind of become three-dimensional, more than just a resume and a list of things that you've done or accomplished in your past. And that's why we encourage you to be authentic. Don't Google how to write a grad school essay. <laughs> we really do read every single one of these. So when you're using your authentic voice and you're really speaking from your heart, that comes across in, in your essay. Um, we laugh with you. We cry with you. We, we feel, you know, we want to advocate for you. So use your authentic voice. Make sure we're getting to know the real you. Um, we also just encourage you for simple things like proofreading. Um, you know, fill in the blanks. And that'll be a little clearer when we talk about some of the items in the next slide. But if there's anything that you worry that the, com the committee might be thinking that you want to clarify, take that opportunity in the statement of purpose. You know, when we get to the transcript slide, I'll talk about GPA. But if that's something you're concerned about, if you're or, you know, worried about how they're going to, to, to view that. Um, talk about what happened. Maybe you had a life event that you need to explain. Maybe you were, you know, just 18 years old and, and you weren't really, you know, didn't really have the, the skill set or the, you know, the, um, you know, tenacity at that time to make it through, but things change over time. So if there's anything you want to address, talk about it there. Talk about what happened. Talk about why it's not an issue anymore. Um, and how you've overcome that so that they can see. So you're painting the picture for the committee about why you're going to be successful in the program and how you're going to be successful. So fill in those blanks. Um, I don't encourage you to use the same essay for each school. Again, schools are looking to see why you're applying to this school. Um, I mean, certainly there are going to be some things that are the same, but you know, make sure you're doing some customization so that that school understands that you wrote that essay for that particular school. And don't disregard specific instructions. If there's a page limit, you know, go by that page limit. If there are specific questions they're asking you to address, which within the application at Fielding, um, when you get to each one of these uh, pages, you're going to have specific instructions in the application that is going to tell you exactly what you need to do, um, whether that be about a page limit, whether that be certain you know, topics they want you to address. So you'll find that in the application portal once you get to those pages. So um, don't worry about that. It's very easy to, to find. But if there are specific questions a committee is asking you, for you to address, there's a reason that they're asking those questions. There's something that they're trying to, to understand, that they need to understand. And they, they, they need you to answer those questions so that they can, they can paint that picture. Um, so make sure you're paying attention to those questions. But again, just this should be one of the easiest parts of the application because you are wanting to pursue a program. Um, you know why you want to do it. It should just it should be easy to put together because you're just speaking from your heart. Just so you know, uh, at Fielding, uh, a statement of purpose is required for all of our programs with the exception of the certificate in media psychology and the certificates in evidence-based coaching. Every other program has a version of a statement of purpose. Again, the page limits might be different. The questions they're asking might be different. Um, but e either way, all of this still stands no matter you know, what those parameters are. The next part is your letters of recommendation. So why do we ask for letters of recommendation? Uh, I'd like to say to get to know you objectively. <laughs> um, it, again, it helps us to understand your personal and professional goals and how your previous experience, um, how your personal development, your professional development has helped prepare you to achieve those goals. It's also going to help us to understand how you're going to fit within the program and how you're going to interact with others. So best practices, prepare your references. You know, if it's somebody you haven't spoken with in a while, send them a copy of your resume. Send them a, a description of the program you're wanting to, to pursue. Um, let them know why you're wanting to do that. You know, if it's something that you want them to talk about, maybe a project you worked on or, or something, you know, give them a couple of reminders so that it's, it's easy for them to know, you know, how, how they can help you, what they can say about you that you really want to make sure is highlighted and that's able to shine. Select your references carefully. 
again, schools are going to have usually have requirements about what type of references they want to see. Uh, for instance, in a doctoral program, um, it is um, it they they may be looking for you know, references from other people who have earned a doctoral degree. That's not always the case, um, but it's something to understand. You know, what are they looking for in letters of recommendation? That will help you to figure out who you should be asking for that. Um, you know, understand how each school accepts letters of recommendation. There may be some schools that uh, just ask for you to to have them emailed directly from the reference. Um, many schools are adopting practices such as the one at Fielding, where all you do is type in the contact information of that reference, and then they get an automated message from the school with a request to complete a, a recommendation, and they do that electronically and send that back. So a lot of schools are going that way, uh, but it's definitely helpful to understand how each school is going to accept those letters of recommendations for you especially if you're wanting to use that for more than one school, uh, you may need to get that letter of recommendation from that person, depending on you know, how they're asking for that. Um, don't, don't ask a family member. You know, we assume, we hope that <laughs> your mom and dad uh, or other family member is going to say great things about you. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't submit a strong recommendation. Um, don't assume they know what to say. As I said, if it's been a while, um, you know, it, uh, it, it may be helpful to, either remind them of something that you worked on together or just let them know, you know, hey, these are the things I'm really hoping to highlight in my, in my application. You could help me highlight some of those things. Um, that helps them, again, to know how they can help you. And don't submit out-of-date letters. Um, I know this can be difficult if you had someone, you know, write you a letter for you know, 10 years ago, um, but it's, it's, it's not as effective, it's not as strong or competitive uh, as it would be to just ask them, you know, to, to give an update. Even if you wanted to send them that, that older letter to say, hey, you know, this is what you wrote at the time. Is there any changes? Would you mind just, um, you know, sending me an updated copy of this? So you're helping them by giving them what they already said about you, but you want to get something up to date. That's going to be the most competitive way to submit a letter of recommendation. Just for you know, for programs at Fielding, um, letters of recommendation are not required for any of our leadership programs in the School of Leadership Studies doctoral or certificate. However, uh, in our School of Psychology, uh, our, there are two letters of recommendations required for the PhD in Infant and Early Childhood Development and Media Psychology, and three letters of recommendation are required for the PhD in Clinical Psychology, the Respecialization in Clinical and the post back certificate in clinical. So just to give you an idea of what the requirements are at Fielding. Next is the resume or CV. Um, sometimes it will ask for resume, sometimes CV, sometimes resume or CV. So what is the difference? I know it's not always easy to understand what the difference is. And a uh, CV is really something that is much more extensive than a traditional resume. A resume will usually list your, you know, your, your, professional experience and your academic experience, maybe um, hobbies or affiliations, um, trainings that you've been through. But a CV is also going to include you know, journal publications, article publications, any um, presentations that you've given at conferences, things of that nature. Um, so you, you would generally know if you have those types of things to add to a CV. If you don't and they're asking for a CV, you submit your resume. And again, that's something that you can address in your statement of purpose. Um, if you feel like you're lacking some of those things, but you, you may have other experiences that you believe um, uh, have prepared you for that program or that have given you similar experience, talk about that in your statement of purpose. Again, helpful in those gaps. Committees can get very creative and fill in the gaps in themselves. So don't let them do that. Just fill it in for them. Talk about it in your statement of purpose. Um, this, the, the, but the reason we ask for this, again, it's to get to know you. Every aspect of it is to get to know you and your goals. Um, this helps us to see what your professional experience has been and also how, how it has helped to shape your goals. So reading your statement of purpose, you know, hearing your, your thought process, your experiences, and then looking at your resume to see how those things come together. Um, for some programs, it might also be important 
uh, to understand whether the program is itself is going to be able to help you accomplish your goals. Um, there are certainly um, uh, certain types of professions out there where the education by itself is not going to, you know, is not going to necessarily um, prepare you to be able to jump right into that. It may be that your experience plus the education is what's necessary to really have a strong um, possibility of success after that program. So again, that's something that they're looking at is with this program, this university and, and what we do and what you have already accomplished is all of this together going to help you accomplish your goals. So do be professional. Um, make sure that it looks professional, that it's pre presented professionally. There are numerous um, numerous resources out there that can help you to do that. You know, focus on your accomplishments and not just a list of, uh, of tasks that you, you know, that you've completed there. Um, and be, be transparent. So if you had any gaps in your work history, again, talk about that in your statement of purpose. If there's anything you think might be like, maybe you had, you know, successive career changes. Talk about it in your statement of purpose. That's not necessarily, that isn't a bad thing. There, there could definitely be reasons for that. But, you know, talk about that and so that you're helping to shape that story for the admissions committee so that they can see and they can say, oh, okay, I understand why they made that change. Or I understand why they were out of the workforce for X amount of time. Or I understand why they, um, you know, they earned a bachelor degree in this, which is wildly different than what they want to do now. I, I see now. Don't focus too much, again, on listing tasks. Um, try not to use too much jargon. I mean, depending on the program you're applying to, that might be relevant. Um, but, you know, for example, and then there are lots of, well, all of our, all of our institutions use abbreviations and jargon. But, you know, try to stay away from that as much as you can um, because a committee might not know what those, what those particular abbreviations stand for. Um, so just keep that in mind. And again, don't overlook school-specific requirements. We don't have any specific requirements at Fielding in terms of page length and things of that nature. Um, it's generally good for a resume, not a CV. Again, a CV is expected to be much longer for a resume. You know, two pages is generally uh, what you want to shoot for. But again, that is not a requirement at Fielding. Um, so, but you want to look at the school requirements for every school you're, you're looking at because some of them may have those types of requirements. And best practices for writing samples and or reflective essay. Now, this is in addition to uh, a personal statement. So, uh, for instance, at Fielding, uh, our, our doctoral programs all require either a writing sample or reflective essay, and a couple of the programs require both. Um, so these are generally going to give you either articles to write about or, or to argue uh, aside about something uh, or a flexion of something that has happened in your life or your career. Again, in, in, for fielding, those instructions are listed um, inside of the application, and you can see everything about page, page length, what articles you can use, uh, and what they're asking you to do. Uh, but the reason that we ask for this is, again, you, over and over again, to get to know you. But also assess your critical thinking skills. Uh, for fielding specifically, these, you know, these are doctoral programs. That piece is very important. You're not expected to come in with all of the tools, right? You know, why would you go pursue education if you already had all the tools? You're trying to add new tools to your toolkit. And there are definitely things that we understand that we're going to teach you in the program. But there are some um, basic things that we want to make sure that you have some fundamental skills that you can be successful in that program. So it allows us to assess where, assess where you at with your critical thinking skills. How are your academic writing skills? And again, there may be resources at uh, the school to help you improve writing skills, but still it kind of gives the committee a baseline about where you are. And again, I encourage you to be authentic. When you're in the program, you're going to be challenged to uh, use your individual voice um, to, to fight and argue for things that you care about, to research things that you care about. So be authentic here. Use your authentic voice here. Showcase your position on the subject, whether you think it's you know, controversial or not, but showcase what, you, what your real position is so they can understand your thought process and what you bring to the table um, and how you assess these things. Um, again, we encourage you to proofread. That kind of seems maybe a silly thing to add, but it's always you know, good practice to make sure you're proofreading. 
don't wait until the last minute. Uh, sometimes that just happens for us. I understand that. But if you have the, you know, we encourage you. Um, so you know about fielding, you, you, there's no time on the application. So you can go in, you can log in, look at the requirements, log out, come back to it later. Um, so, you know, go into it, look and see what, what the requests are. You can start working on it. Um, you don't have to wait until you're ready to submit it to go into the application and look at those things. Um, we also don't encourage you to reuse old writing samples. So if you're applying to a, a program and maybe you weren't offered admission the last time that you applied, you, always best practice if there's something in the application that can change, it probably should. Because if it, was, if it didn't, if it wasn't competitive enough to get you in the last time, don't assume that it may be that if you reuse the same materials, it could be competitive this time. So anything that you can strengthen, meaning you can rewrite your essays, um, you know, you can update your resume, you can choose new references to write your letters of recommendation. You know, the only thing you can't change is your undergraduate degree, which we'll talk about in the ne next slide. But things that you can make improvements on, really evaluate those things um, and, and, and do your best not to reuse old samples. Um, and last, kind of, again, feels silly to have to talk about, but don't complain about the articles. <laughs> there, again, there's a reason that they were chosen. Um, the ones that we use have to be open source, so there are certain parameters that we have to operate within. Um, and there's, there's reason that those particular articles were chosen. So um, just do the best that you can to make arguments or to write about what is requested of you. And on the left here, I wrote, uh, I put in which programs that we have that require each of these. Um, so the infant and early childhood development and media programs require a critical thinking writing sample. The EDD program requires a reflective essay. And our PhDs in human development and org development and change require both writing sample and a reflective essay. Last but not least is your transcripts. Again, why? Get to know you. Understand your past academic experience, how you performed. Determine your readiness for graduate level work. This is not the only thing we use to determine your read readiness for graduate level work. There is much more to it than just academic experience. However, that is an indicator of how you'll perform in the program. I mean, the further away that you are from your undergraduate degree, it could be less relevant. Your work experience might become more relevant depending on that program. Or if, uh, if it's, dep again, depending on the program and what they're looking for, it may be a good idea to um, maybe take a, a open an online course or a community college course or something else. Um, but this is the one thing you can't change. No one expects you to go back and do a second undergraduate degree to get another, a better GPA. That's just, you know, I, I had a lot of people ask if they should do that. And that is, that is not necessary because we know that's the one thing that can't change. But what can change is your overall, I mean, your, yourself, right? Your, your attitude towards life, your attitude towards academics. Maybe at the undergraduate level, you know, you hadn't found your passion yet. And so once you found your passion, you, you perform exponentially better when you find your passion than you did in undergraduate work when you were still just trying to figure it out. Uh, so we understand all of those things. But again, that's something if your GPA is not, you know, like my, my, my own, not something that I was super proud of at the undergraduate level. So whenever I applied to my first master's program, I talked about that in my essay. I said, this is, you know, I, I really was finding myself. I was young. I, I wasn't taking it seriously. I didn't attend class as much as I should, but I've got out into the real world. I learned people depend on me. Um, and, and I've, I've made a, a shift in the way that I think and the way that I act. Um, and I'm a different person now. That's why I know that I'm going to be successful in this program. So you can take that opportunity to talk about it. Um, but really exhibit self-awareness. Don't try not to make excuses. I mean, excuses are different than reasons, right? So if there are things that happened, um, there could be definitely life events and things that can affect your GPA. So share that. You can be open with that. Uh, but just, you know, be, be self-aware when you're talking about that, that you make sure that it's, it's not coming across as an excuse that they can understand why these things affected your, your, your performance at the undergraduate level. 
Um, but consider your options and be realistic. Um, you know, it, it may be a good idea, but to, to, to go take an, another an, an individual course um, in, in the particular area that you're looking at to show that you can, it, you can do, get a strong grade uh, with that particular material. But that's why it's important to dive into the particular program that you're looking at, uh, talk to the, the, the admissions advisors that can help you to understand what we're looking for and what might help you in your particular application. Um, again, don't make excuses. Don't wait to order transcripts. Um, you know, if you know, if, when you make your short list and you know the programs that you're applying to, get them on order, you know, um, and don't offer, overlook opportunities to showcase your academic strengths. So if you took graduate level courses or certificates or other things that you've accomplished, um, you know, provide that. Even if it's not required, you might still, we might still want to provide that, especially if your undergraduate performance wasn't exactly what you had hoped it would be. Um, just so you know about programs at Fielding, we, we require transcript, uh, uh, official transcripts for all of the programs. Um, there are a few programs that also offer the option to do a degree verification or as in all you do basically in the application is check the box um, saying that you authorize a degree verification and then we will uh, verify that degree and you would not be uh, required to submit transcripts. That process can take a little bit longer, so keep that in mind. Um, but those programs are the Certificate in Organizational Development and Leadership, the Certificate in Media Psychology, and the Certificates in Evidence-Based Coaching. All other programs will require official transcripts. Now that I've talked a little bit generally about transcripts, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caroline. Thank you, Erica. Now, if you earned your degree outside of the U.S. for any of the programs you're applying to, whether it be a certificate, master's, or doctoral degree, it will require an international transcript evaluation. So there are a few different agencies you can order that from, and this screenshot here on, this, on the page is actually from our website. So all of these details are available on the website with further links to the specific organizations that you're welcome to order the evaluation from. And one really important aspect is the type of evaluation you need to order. It, it, um, you will need to order an evaluation that lists each course with grades and a cumulative GPA, which is usually called a course-by-course -course evaluation. So please be sure to order that specific type of evaluation from the agency you're choosing. And you'll need to provide an original transcript to the evaluation service according to their particular process. So be sure to pay attention to their uh, process and how they need to uh, submit all the documents. And if you have any questions, you know, we're all here to help. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us regarding which degree you'll need that verified for. If you have a bachelor's degree or a master's, depending on the program, we might just need one, we might need both. So be sure to connect with your admissions advisor if you have any questions on what is required for your particular degree. Now, another important aspect of this is it can take some time. So if you are applying for a particular term, just be sure to be aware of the application deadline and how soon you might need to order the international degree, the international transcript evaluation so that it's all coming in at a, in a timely fashion. But again, we're here to help, so please don't hesitate to reach us with any questions on what is needed for your particular application. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. All right, to summarize, what the commission, admissions committees are thinking is really boiled down to three things. Is this the right program to help you accomplish your goals? Is this the right place to help you do that? And is this the right time for you to be pursuing this particular program? So with that, hopefully you feel a little bit more empowered to approach your application and how to approach each of the different aspects of it and understand why the committee is asking for it and how they're using it in the evaluation process. So I'm now going to turn it over to Brian, who's going to walk you quickly through the fielding application portal to demystify the technology. 
Perfect. Thank you, Erica. So before I dive into the application portal itself, I just want to reiterate that um, all of these documents that are required for your specific program um, do have more, more information within the application portal. So if you're wondering about prompts or anything like that, once you log into the application portal, you'll be able to see all of the prompts for your writing samples and as, as well as the requirements for your specific program. Um, so once you do know that this is the right place, the right program, and the right time for you. Um, it's really easy to get started on an application. If you navigate to our fielding web pages, you'll just have to find the yellow apply now button in the upper right hand corner of the page. Go ahead and click that button to get started. Now if you've already made an account with us, you'll just enter in your email and password to log in. But if you're a new user, you'll want to click on the new user button down at the bottom to create your account. And to get registered, there's just a few few sections to complete here. So you'll enter in your email, you, you'll confirm your password, and then you'll enter in the program that you'd like to apply for, as well as the term that you'd like to apply for. Once you do create your account, or once you've logged in, if you have already created an account, you'll go ahead and click on the My Applications tab at the, at the header of the page. Once you click that, you'll see a list of your applications. If you have a previous application on file, it will still be listed within this portal. So be sure to click on the application that is listed as active. When you get started, there will be three sections to complete. So your demographic information, your contact information, and your program information. And once you do complete those three sections, the rest of the application portal will be populated for you. It does populate according to your program, so that's how you'll know all of the specific requirements for your program, as well as the prompts and everything like that. So this, on the left here, you can see the entire application checklist. So you'll, it's really easy, you just go through this checklist one by one and make sure you're entering all of the required information. So you'll enter in your educational background, there's a section there for your transcript instructions, so you will need to order your official transcripts from your university where you completed your undergraduate or your, your graduate education. I did see that there were a couple of questions about if a bachelor's or a master's transcripts are required or if we require both. Now that is, those requirements are specific to the individual programs. Some programs require either a bachelor's or a master's degrees, transcripts, other programs require one or the other. And then additionally, as uh, Caroline mentioned, if you're an international applicant, you will want to send us your international transcript evaluation as well. So there are a couple more sections to go through. So you will have your supplemental application documents. Now the supplemental application documents is the section where you'll find the prompts for your, your writing samples, your statement of purpose. It'll include the details about page limits, um, APA formatting and everything along those lines. There's a brief section for additional information, um, a couple more questions to answer. Then you'll also have your, your area of to enter in contact information for your recommenders. How it works with fielding is we have you enter in the names and contact information for your recommenders. And then we send an email out to your recommenders on your behalf, asking them to submit a letter of recommendation for you. Once they receive that email, there will be a link to a portal where they can then enter in a, a letter of recommendation for you. Now the final component when everything is all completed is to actually submit the application. So normally there is a $75 application fee, but um, since you've all attended today, that fee will be waived for you. So what you will see is this, this page here where you just give your consent and uh, you'll enter in the date of, that you are submitting your application. And then you'll just click submit application. So it's as easy as that. Um, you don't have to enter in any kind of code or anything like that for your fee waiver. It is applied to your account automatically, um, so you don't have to do anything on your end. You just won't be prompted for payment when you click submit. 
And from there, we're going to pass it over to Caroline, who's going to talk about your next steps before you decide to, uh, to apply to the program. A few final things to help you navigate the process. Thank you, Brian. So um, we absolutely understand everyone's situation is different and you may have particular questions, which is why we're all here to help. So if you haven't already spoken with an admissions advisor, you're welcome to connect with us by phone or email. And we understand your schedule might be really busy. So if you need to coordinate a call ahead of time, you know, a time and date, just let us know and we'll be happy to set up an appointment with you. In addition to speaking with admissions advisors and program directors, our financial aid team is available to speak with even before you decide to apply. Uh, you can connect with them by email or use their appointment calendar to schedule a time to meet with them through Zoom. And our next virtual open house series is actually dedicated specifically to uh, that topic, financial aid. So we hope you can join us for the next one, part three, funding your education, making your goal a reality. That will be next week, October 7th at 11 a.m. Pacific. We have some other upcoming events as part of the virtual open house series. Part four is about is excited or scared, you know, coming back, asking us any of those difficult questions you haven't had answered. And then the last part five is a Q&A with our program directors. So if, even if you've joined us for a webinar, even if you've spoken with us, and you just have some last minute questions that week of the submission deadline for our spring term, please join us for the particular program you're applying for and come and ask those last minute questions. And on the next slide, we have some upcoming information session dates. So if you haven't already joined us for those, that's a great way just to get a comprehensive overview of your particular program of interest. They're typically hosted by the program director or lead faculty member and an admissions advisor like myself or Brian is there to answer questions about admissions. So there's so many ways to connect with us, stay engaged, and just make sure that all of your questions are answered before you're ready to apply. <laughs>